Ivan Zinger is Canada's correctional investigator. He's with me now. Good to see you again. Uh, thanks for coming to speak with me about your uh, latest report today. L let's begin with your findings about the deadly riot in the Saskatchewan Penitentiary in 2016. That left one inmate dead, eight, eight others injured. Uh, you say the Correctional Service withheld information and, and misled the public. How, how did they do that? Well, they um, <clears throat> uh, first they conducted a, an internal investigation, mm -hmm. and the investigation found that the uh, riot was actually spontaneous, a random act, and that uh, no way they could have foreseen it or foreseen yeah. it. It was not predictable. Uh, and they uh, basically said that food and with respect to quality or quantity was uh, uh, not a contributing factor. Uh, that was the finding of their internal investigation. Mm -hmm. um, last March, the service actually published a summary of the, its internal investigation, and the, uh, the two stories don't, don't jive, because then they basically said that food was related and that tension within the kitchen uh, were a contributing factor. Uh, so I think Canadians were misled because uh, it wasn't uh, open and transparent and it shows some real significant issues around accountability. Right. This was seen more as an exercise, if you want, of public relations and communication as opposed to uh, making sure that they were true to what they found. Yeah, so you, uh, you actually found that there was a problem, uh, you know, when you, when you looked at, at the information. There, was a, there, there were some serious problems in that penitentiary uh, that were, if I can put it that way, that were glossed over by the investigation? Yeah, that they, they choose not to look into it. Uh, for example, with respect to uh, food, I mean, last year in my annual mm -hmm. report, I, I, I even uh, uh, said uh, in my preliminary findings that food was a contributing factor. Yeah, I remember we talked about it then. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, and, um, and this time around, they choose not to pinpoint uh, to the problem uh, for whatever reason. I mean, even in their investigation, they interviewed only one offender. Can you believe it? Like, if if food is is a is an issue, wouldn't you want to uh, find out what the problem was? Mm -hmm. um, so they they purposely avoided some tough issues, and food was only one of the issues because there was certainly uh, a lack of um, uh, thoroughness with respect to uh, the group dynamic in those ranges. They failed to mention that 85% in the rioting ranges were indigenous from indigenous backgrounds. Right and 50% uh, were actually uh, affiliated with, with gangs. Um, and unfortunately, we, we never also found out anything by the fact that most of them were uh, warehouse idling in that penitentiary, where only, for example, 5% were actually um, enrolled in, in uh, core programming. Right. Um, many of them were unemployed. Uh, very few of them were registered to school. So this was a problem waiting to happen. I mean, what your, your, your recommendations suggest that, okay, that, that's, the correction service should no longer investigate itself when it has a major incidents such as this, right? Uh, absolutely. So I think they, they, with this investigation for me, they forfeited the, their right to investigate themselves in some of those rare in instances. Mm -hmm. And I want to make it uh, very clear, uh, riots are extremely rare in, in Kane Penitentiary, uh, especially in a medium security institution. Um, so I believe that the minister should, uh, you know, make sure that uh, in cases of deadly riots, in cases where somebody dies in administrative segregation, or in cases of death following a use of force, that uh, the minister make sure that uh, the service uh, no longer police or investigate itself, and that somebody from outside looks into it. The federal government has tabled a bill to end solitary confinement. Um, as we sort of now know it. Uh, it. You know, it confines inmates to the cell 22 hours a day. Instead, the government proposes the creation of new uh, prison uh, units, specialized living units, they're called for high-risk inmates, that would allow them four hours a day of uh, outside their cells and two hours of human interaction. How much of an improvement is that as far as you're concerned? Well, the, the funny thing is that they, they could have done that without legislation. So this is purely up to the, the correctional service could actually uh, do that currently with no legislation. Um, what I find problematic is that, uh, yes, it's a good news that we are technically no longer uh, falling under, uh, we're, we're basically have prohibited solitary confinement as defined by the UN, which is a 22 hour uh, in your cell. We're pushed that to 
uh, 20 hours, but it's still a very highly restrictive environment. Um, and uh, the problem with the legislation is that uh, this new regime would only be uh, sort of managed at the discretion of the Correctional Service of Canada with no oversight uh, and no guarantee uh, from now on uh, or if the legislation passed uh, that these restrictive environments would not become commonplace in the correctional system. Right. Your so concern is it might just get used more often because it looks like it's a lesser a, a less restrictive tool, so they would turn to it more often because it's more available. A, 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 and easier to uh, to manage people right. by locking them up on, a, on an extensive uh, period of time in penitentiary. So it removes some of the due process, um, and there's no oversight, and there's no limit on any of it. Uh, so I think this is why I think that uh, despite the, the good intention of the new commissioner, the good intention of the minister, legislation has to have a long you know, sort of a cycle that it will sustain a new commissioner, a new minister, a new government. Right. Um, and if it's only uh, internal review uh, mechanism and checks and balances, for me, it makes no sense. Okay. Uh, we've seen politicians speak out about the treatment of some uh, prisoners, most recently the transfer of, uh, that was well publicized of a convicted child killer to a healing lodge in Saskatchewan. Uh, against the wishes of the victim's family. What are your thoughts on the role of politicians speaking out uh, about the, the handling of some prisoners, as we've seen in that case? Well, the, uh, you know, uh, first I can't talk about specific cases right. and ombudsman uh, unless there's uh, some sort of uh, uh, legislative authority that allows me to talk uh, about those cases. But I'll say something is that every time politician talks about uh, crime and punishment, uh, I cringe and I become very concerned. How come? Um, uh, because typically um, they they rely on egregious cases to you know to basically uh, for political uh, points uh, and the end result is that uh, it, it follows that famous legal maxim is that hard cases make for bad law and bad policy and that's what we have seen time and again certainly under the Harper years uh, and it also backs into the corner the other political parties because they can't uh, defend themselves because they're afraid of being seen as, uh, as soft on crime uh, and also unsympathetic or, or, or lack compassion. But, but isn't some people would say, uh, look, so it's, the, it's the role of a, a politician. They're elected to represent people. If they see something egregious in the way someone's being treated, why wouldn't they speak it? Well, because it's it's always the cases. They always pick those egregious cases. So uh, so there's a, a it's politically motivated for sure. Um, so they never talk about the whole system. Uh, they, they pick those egregious cases to make their uh, uh, their case, and what we've seen time and again, and whether I you know uh, you know let, let me you know name a few of those initiatives that were repealed, like the Fate Hope uh, clause mm -hmm. and and uh, the introduction of whole sorts of mandatory uh, minimum sentences, uh, the removal of the least restrictive criteria, uh, and the list goes on. Uh, you know, uh, accelerated parole review. All things that uh, makes a lot of sense with respect to public safety uh, were uh, abandoned using those egregious cases. So that's why I cringe, uh, because I, I can see it coming. Um, if you want public safety, uh, you know, the, the, the reality is that it's the judges that impose the sentence and retribution is part of it and incarceration is, is imposed as punishment. You don't want the politician nor the Correctional Service of Canada to modulate the amount of punishment you're giving to an offender. Um, that is counterproductive and it goes against uh, our human rights uh, uh, framework, which Canada is, is, is trying to be a leader on. Okay, um, thanks for your perspective. Appreciate your time today. Thank you.